So we've all been sitting just a little while, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask you to vote by standing up. So stay seated until I've asked the question. So the first question is, is stand up if you've got a cell phone on you right now. Now I want you to stay standing. Now is there anybody sitting down? Is there anybody in this room sitting down? We've got one guy. Joe! He's in the car. Okay. <laughs> Alright, now, the next question is, I want you to, to sit down if you have not texted or posted anything on social media yet today. Snapchat, anything like that. So sit down if you have not done any of that. So look around, look at all these folks, and in what I thought, it's really not true, which is kind of interesting to me, I thought that there would only be 30 year olds standing up or 100, and there's not. So, do me a favor, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever, um, that's how we communicate these days. The other piece is, you can go ahead and sit down now. It's, it's, this is, what, this is what we're talking about data. Everybody says data, we've got to collect more data. It's what we're doing with your cell phone, is you're collecting a tremendous amount of data. You're checking the weather, you're checking the grain markets, you're connecting with your friends, you're doing all kinds of things, just basic communication. But all that, we're in a digital era, that's digital data. So for those of us sometimes, especially when you get to be in this business for as long as I have, you go, on. I'm not a part of this digital age. That's, that's somebody else. That's my kids that are doing that. And it's not. It's all of us. I, the other point, I, as I'm sitting here, I know we've got some high schoolers here today. Tremendous opportunity for you high school guys. Um, the, the, the data era is yours. When I grew up, it was, it was about mechanics. And when my dad grew up, it was about hard work. The guy that could work the hardest won. In my ear, it was the guy that was smart about mechanics, could usually win. You guys, it's about data. If you can manage data, if you enjoy managing data, agriculture is a wide open field for you. Guys and girls both, which is also unique. In my ear, there was no girls that got involved in agriculture. And today, it's wide open. Still got battles for you ladies, but it's wide open. So, I think it's a cool time. So when it's all said and done, uh, we, we joke at our office because we're always talking about Leibniz Law. Leibniz Law the minimum. You've probably heard, if you've heard me talk, I usually put this in a slide. And, and the, then Dr. Bilo put this in order of what's most important that affects yield. So what's the lowest stave in the barrel? Because the lowest stave in the barrel was our most yield limiting factor. And so number one is weather. Another way to say that is water. If we can manage water, we can do a lot in crop production. It just so happens it's the one that's toughest to manage, the nitrogen and hybrid and so forth and so on. So what precision ag is, is we're trying to plug those lowest staves in the barrel. It's what we've been trying to do forever in farming. But what's different about precision ag is, is you're hearing all these things about sensor technology and computerization and so forth. It's how we're learning how to automate these systems to do them better, faster, and more efficient. I'm going to start with, with some of the practical pieces. And around here, it's the reason for this building. On the other side of this building is a soil lab. You're going to see that in a little bit. It's, it's, it's one of the kind of baseline pieces of data that we use in, in crop production, that's soil sampling. But the thing that's different is that we have to look at soil sampling and we have to look at why or how we farm, not only from a production basis. Once again, when I was growing up, it was how do I lower that cost per bushel? That was it. If I could be the least cost producer, I won. 
Today, you've got to be the least cost producer and you've got to be an environmentalist. No, you've got to be an environmentalist and you've got to be the least cost producer. And we have got, as farmers, we have got to think of it that way. We cannot think of it anymore as, I just got to figure out how to raise more bushels. Because the world around us is not going to accept that. And if we think there are, we're wrong. Go to Europe, where they're banning things like Roundup. Is that going to happen in the United States? I don't know. But we have to think about the environmental aspects of what we're doing. And the four R's is a great place. It's a great message to get out to our non-ag folks. But it's more than a message. It's also what we need to be doing as farmers. We need to be able to justify every pound of fertilizer we use or we don't use. And that's really based on a good soil sampling program. So one of the things that, that we did about six, seven years ago is from a soil sampling standpoint, it's, it's really about we're taking a soil sample and we're trying to mimic what the nutrient content is in the field. Then we decided, no, we're going to take soil samples and we're going to mimic what's in this area of the field. And then we said, no, we can do it better than that. We're going to take soil samples and we're going to take lots of them and we're going to be able to model the nutrient levels in the field. So here's an example of a field that's actually right across the road. That's where our field demos are today, so you can walk out in there and look at it. And this is an organic matter map, and this was sent <coughs> from two and a half acre grids means every two and a half acres we took a soil test. You can see in the far left corner there's those dots there. That's where we took the soil samples. And what we did is we used the computer to do what's called interpolation. Another way to say that is estimate. We estimated from one point to the next. So the farther those points are apart from each other, the more we have to rely on the computer, the software, to estimate the values in between. And from that we can create a map. So one of the challenges is, is that when we do soil sampling, collecting soil samples is tedious, hard work, and there's lots of variability in it, and all kinds of other things, and, and uh, you'll see that when we go, go through the lab earlier on. So what we learned from being in this business for 37 years is there's only one way to skin this cat, and that is we have to take more data points. If we can take more data points, we do less interpolation between points. We use the real data and that gives us more accurate math. So what we end up with is when you put them side by side, when you have 26 sample points, you get a real blurry picture. The picture is not necessarily wrong, it's just real blurry. And then on the right hand side there uh, is where we did the half acre grids, so it's just higher resolution. And we'll go down the quarter acre grid sometime. And guess what? The resolution becomes even more fine. So why is that important? Because we're doing precision agriculture. We're going to take this kind of data. So this is a great P1 phosphorus. Same thing, two and a half acre grids. The red would be considered a relatively low area, and the greens would be in the medium, medium high area. So from a precision ag standpoint, we only put additional fertilizer on the red areas. Green areas, we either put nothing or we put a reduced rate on. We save money, we maximize production. Got it. So what happens when we go to higher density? We still got the same capabilities. We can still do variable rate applications. But now, we've just given us high definition. So we can do a better job of finding those areas that really need it and find those areas that really don't. So if we don't have high resolution data, and we're basing it off of low resolution data, there's a pretty good chance we're making mistakes. So really what it boils down to on soil sampling is, is what's my cost and can I afford to do it as far as the resolution goes. This is just another way to look at it. Uh, this is just, we, what we did is we compared everything to quarter acre grids. So we, we said quarter acre was perfect. How does half acre compare to quarter acre? We get R squares of about 0 0.7, 0 0.75. We knock out every other point, we go to one acre grids, we see the R squares go down. We go to two and a half acre grids, we see the R squares go down again. What that means is they're not reliable, not repeatable, the lower the R squares get. So we also learned some things we don't like. One of those things is, is, is 
spatially, we're, it's, it's, it's where it is in space, where it is in the field. We're doing pretty good about understanding the spatial variability in the field. We, we can master that by taking lots of samples, or at least we can, we can get to a place we can, we can understand it pretty good. So what about the temporal stability? Temporal stability is change over time. How much does the soil test change? And in our world, we don't want things to change. We want them to stay the same. So if we sample this field and it says we need potash, we put potash on it, we see the correction, the next time we soil sample that field, that field is going to show that we put that potash on and it is it has gone up. Right? Not so much. So what we have here is, is, is in 2000, okay, 2011, on the left side, we soil sampled that field quarter acre grids, four samples per acre, one sample every 100 feet. Spatially, we did pretty good. And then we came back in, in 2015, so four years later, and we've been putting fertilizer on this field, but what we saw is, is we saw our potassium levels starting to go down some. Still, two samples, two different kinds. We're, we're seeing a trend, so we'll, we'll put more potash on it. So then we come in 2015, and this is when we're starting to see, hey, wait a second, we're not, this thing isn't trending like we thought it was. So in 2015, we're seeing, oh, we're seeing a little bit of the same trend, but still have low potassium levels. And just so happens, this is in an area of the field that has high organic matter, uh, high CEC content, high clay content, so very highly productive, but it tends to tie up a lot of potassium. Well then, bam, in 2016, we've been putting all this potash on and our levels are going down and they're not going up. What is going on? So we come back in 2017 and we actually sampled in the spring and sampled in the fall and then things started to correct and go back in the other direction. So what does this mean? This means that we don't live in a perfect world and we've got to understand that we live within that world. So this is why we have to sample often. We cannot just go in and sample, and, and I'm guilty of this. When we did, we came out with our half acre grid sampling, we told all our customers, we told them, A, we were gonna sample once every six years, we don't need to sample more often than that because we spatially figured it out, it's done. And we'll correct, and we'll be over. I even made the statement that I think in 10 years we're gonna be out of the soil sample business because we're gonna fix the problems and we're going to move on. From a spatial standpoint, soil is a living organism. There's a lot of chemistry going on. Really what the answer is today is that we need to sample, I think, with high definition sampling, it should be every four years. If you're doing two, two and a half acre grids, it should be every two to three years. And zone sampling it should be every other year. So you can accommodate what's going on with that, that temporal instability. So what do we do with this stuff? Um, one of the things that's really cool for us is it's neat to use soil tests and it's neat to use those from the standpoint of making very, very fertilizer applications and lime applications and things like that. But because we got this real dense data set, we can start to take it a little further. Andrew's going to talk in more detail how to do this, but we can create management zones that pull in all these different layers from uh, CEC and organic matter from the soil test historic yield, slope of the topography, and from that we can do lots of other cool things. We call it a CPU, and it's, it's CPU stands for Common Production Units, and what that does is that allows us to now standardize your farm across your whole farming operation. So if we call it a CPU 9, and it's in this field, and you've got another field that's 10 miles away, and it's got a CPU 9 in it, we know that they're both highly productive areas, and they're going to respond similarly. We can pull a lot of this data out of the soil test, like I said. That helps us a bunch when we start to, when we start to talk about data analytics, how to look at the data. Some of the things we can do is, this is just one example, because we've established where the highly productive areas are, where the low producing areas are, we can leverage that data now, which started with the soil test, and we can start saying, let's create a very great seeding recommendation. In corn, we know that those highly productive soils can produce, they're gonna, they can handle a higher population and they won't blank out as quick. 
On low producing areas in corn, we know we've got to watch pushing high populations because they will either get ear drop back or we'll get blanks all together. So we leverage the CPU to manage that, and that's driving a, a variable rate seeding prescription, not off of one thing, but off of typically six to seven layers of data. This is just, uh, I think this came out of Pioneer. It's, it's, uh, it just shows that the different maturities have different plant populations that where they peak out at as far as, as uh, what the correct population is. My point in all this is, is, so we start with the CPU map, and we give you a variable rate recommendation. Then you can easily, especially with today's technology, adjust those recommendations to match the hybrid. So we can still, or we can take this technology and take it right to a specific hybrid to match that population in the light soil versus dark soil. Learning blocks. What are learning blocks? This comes back to there were some comments about doing uh, on-farm research. So I'm going to back into this just a little bit. What's the challenge with on-farm research? It's on the farm. It's tough. Uh, on-farm research means that we're going to set up a, a trial in your field, and you're not allowed to do anything but the right thing in that field the rest of the year. And that's hard to do. Um, my own farm, you think, yeah, I got this figured out, and the next thing you know, you put two varieties in the field instead of one, you did a split planter, you weren't supposed to, or you sprayed, you know, spot sprayed herbicides, or whatever. So what a, what a learning block is, is we're trying to capture um, the ability to use your farm, but we're using a computer system that creates these learning blocks. So there's three learning blocks in this field, and each learning block is replicated five times. So we've managed to get our replications in there. It takes a small area of the field so we don't completely mess with you farmers trying to do research. And we set these up such that, for example, if it's a variable rate seeding kind of thing, we'll give you a prescription that you'll load in your planter, and it's going to change those populations within each one of those five replications as you plant across the field. As the operator, you don't have to worry about when do I change the population, when do I stop. It's doing it for you. The next thing that happens is, is, is you harvest this field. And when you harvest it, we're just simply going to capture your yield data, run it through the software. It's going to clean up the edges and, and give us a real nice statistical package. So now what happens is, is, is we're going to use the CPUs to make sure we place these learning blocks in the right spot. We can also take this and we can take this across many fields. Maybe we'll have one on your field and one on your field and one on your field. And we can have them, so you're not doing a whole bunch of these, you're only doing one of them, but because we know what the CPUs are and they're standardized, we can pull this data across many fields and get lots of really good information on things like does fungicide play, pay, do we know what the right population is. And we can do this hopefully accurately and without a lot of burden on you. Precision imagery and scouting. I, I always try to add the word scouting in. Right now, we're not very good at the scouting part, but we've got to get there. Um, this is Skyler. Skyler and I made a trip out to Silicon Valley. It was the craziest trip we ever made. And uh, this is a hybrid drone. Thing's got a gasoline engine on it and uh, has the capability of flying for five hours. Capable of flying for five hours. We crashed it twice, so not perfected yet. But think about how much data we can collect with a piece of equipment that can stand in the air for five hours. And, and, and if, you, if any of you have worked with drones at all, I mean, today is a great example. Few beautiful blue skies. We wanted to do a demo for you, and we can't. It's too windy. But if we can find those windows and we can put that thing in the air and keep it in the air for five hours, we can collect a lot of really good data and do a lot of really good stuff. So what are some of the opportunities? So in our part of the world, probably most of Ohio, we had uh, some really, really heavy rains after planting for about, I don't remember, but I, it seemed like 30 days. 
And what happened with all that rain is, is we lost a tremendous amount of nitrogen. I'd say in Ohio, if we've got one huge yield limiting factor this year, it's loss of N. In this field here, where you see the green, this is high resolution uh, multispectral data collected with the slant range. Skyler took these images. And so we got, got a lot of detail in this, but we know we got a problem. We got, we've got serious nitrogen issues. This corn was probably shoulder high, probably close to passing uh, when we basically had an opportunity to, to look at it. So what we can do is, is the image on the left is a variable rate nitrogen recommendation built off the image off the right. And so now what we can do is, is instead of going in and applying nitrogen on this whole field, and we know we've got problems, we're only going to apply nitrogen basically in the light colored areas is where we're going to apply nitrogen. So we've become very, very efficient at that nitrogen application. We're collecting that data at a time when we really, really know the difference. There's a lot of models out there. John talked about these models, and the models are based mostly on weather and soil type. And, and, and we need something more than that, uh, especially if we're trying to make a nitrogen application when the corn is sub knee high and we got a lot of weather that comes after that. So I think imagery has some real potential. Here. This is a picture um, on the left-hand side. This is a strip that was left. You can see um, on this here, you see the firing on the corn and the obvious nitrogen deficiencies. On the right is where they applied 80 units of nitrogen in those areas that were asking for nitrogen. I mean, visually, we can see big differences. It wasn't hard to figure out what we did. Um, once again, there's pretty good opportunities here. This is an image from back in 2015. Uh, this is an image done with Air Scout, which includes thermal imagery on top of, of uh, RGB and NIR. And they combine all these together and they call it an ADPI image. But it's the same thing. The blue, purple areas are the areas that are the coolest and the most actively growing. And then the red areas, to contrast, the red areas are areas that, that have problems. Um, as I recall, this was flown sometime, this is a corn field, and it was flown sometime in, in uh, I think the corn was probably about B10, someplace right in here. This time. You can see a lot of streaking going on. And at the same time you see streaking, anybody that's looked at imagery knows right off the hand, that's man-made, something going on. And it was very wet. It was a very, very wet year that year. So in general, I'll tell you what's going on is the red areas and the yellow areas were where we had nitrogen deficiencies and where the blue areas are we didn't. Uh, but particularly the red areas where we were short on nitrogen. The black dotted lines through there are tram lines. So we would expect to see traffic patterns in the tram lines. That's where we're, we're doing control traffic, doing it right. Well, not really. Um, so you see in between those black lines, you see some streaking still. Those are planter passes. That's the only trip across that field was those planter passes. It never, it's no-till, no ground was worked, nitrogen was applied, 120 feet. Everything was done 120 feet in those black strips and seven. So we know it was a planter. We know that was a problem. We never would have pulled this out without the imagery. We never would have thought about the, I mean, we kind of, in general, yeah, we think we're short on nitrogen, but that really quantified it. But, so what we did here is we went back in and we went into those pinch rows. We went where we knew we had drove. You saw the streaks in the map, and on the top is outside of that. So that is where we had no traffic at all. And then right in the very worst, right the, where, the, where we know we had the problems, where the traffic was right on top of it, that's what we got. And we, we basically did the old beer count and the kernel count, and calculated the yields, and, and, and the whole field wasn't going to make 82. It was only those two passes out of 120 feet. But we now have a quantitative measure of a problem we've got to figure out how to solve. And it was probably exacerbated because it was a wet year. It is what it is. So when I come back to scouting, we have to get to the place where we do quantitative measurements. Right now what we're doing is, as you see the, the map on the right, 
I mean, that's just an observation measurement. It's a picture. And we can look at that picture and we can glean some stuff out of that picture. And we can go, yeah, we, we know that there's a good area and a bad area and maybe it makes sense. But what we're not doing is we're not quantitatively doing where we need to count things. And if we can start counting things. So one of our goals is to be able to start counting plants. That is a plant stand map up there. And the one on the left is, is a zoom in of one image out of many images. So what we want to be able to do with our imagery is we want to get to the place that we can go to your farm and we can take a picture of your whole farm and we can tell you what your plant stands are across your farm. Why is that important? Well, if we can do that, we can then go in and we can say, what's your plant stand by CPU? We can go in and say, what's your plant stand by CPU by hybrid? Do we have a good or a bad hybrid? Right now we do this all observational. We walk into the field, We'll go to a spot where you go, yep, that's that hybrid, yep, that's that stand, in that spot. But if we could do that across your whole farm, you're going to make much better decisions on what is the best hybrid. Uh, Doug talked about planting situations, when to plant, when not to plant. All those things, because they're quantitative, we can st start to do analysis against this. This is where we're headed. This is, and it's not five years out, it's two years out, and there's a lot coming. In-cab data management. Things are changing here really fast too. If you have not done this, you've got to get on board with this. The cloud-based systems are, are just phenomenal what they can do today and how much they've changed in the last couple of years. What I'm talking about is, is so what used to happen is, is we didn't have any yield monitor, so we would, we would count trucks coming out of the field. You ever, you ever counted trucks, Doug? And, and that's how we determined yield. And it made for really good stories in the coffee shop because some guys' trucks were way smaller than other guys' trucks. So then we got yield monitors, and we still have the coffee shop talk. And, but then it was one guy. There was only one guy that saw the yield monitor, and that was the guy in the combine. And so that guy, if he, and, and, and I think in a lot of situations today, the guy running the combine is the uncle, is the retired dad, is the mom, it's, it's, it's not the front tier, front tiers and top tier guy making the decision, it's the next tier down. So we lost all that because that person would either have to interpret it back to us, the decision maker, and then we would in turn take that and run with it. The other piece is, is we would wait till after harvest and we would print off all these yield maps and nobody ever looks at it. It just doesn't happen. Why? Because it's past tense. All the seed decisions have already been made, and so it just doesn't have a lot of relevance. Cloud-based systems allow us to share that data. You've heard that term. And we can share it quickly so the decision maker can see what's the best hybrid, why yields are such, where do we need to put trucks, how full are the bins, have I sold enough. All those decisions happen really quickly in, in, in we still have a lot of guys that tell us that, well, oh, that's okay, that's good for you, because now you don't have to come out and collect my yield data, I'll give it to you on the thumb drive, but it's way more than that, guys. And it's not very expensive to get on the cloud-based systems. Ag Leader, I'll put a little pitch in for them, they just, they've now got systems where you can have a tablet. So you can have a tablet at your green system, you can have a tablet in your semi, and you can be watching the data flow in as the combine's harvesting. Really, really cool. Gosh, don't want to lose that. That's my memory. So, you guys remember these? This was top notch stuff. I got one of these. This is where I store my Dropbox stuff illegally. It takes 8,000 of these to fit into one. See that right there? One of these. Now that's memory. I wish I had that. <laughs> that's a game changer. Those are some of the things that are happening. We're not done with that. That's what allows cloud, when you see all these cloud services, why everybody wants to have your data stored on their cloud. It's cheap. And we need to leverage that and we need to use it. Processing. You can't see this, but 
Moore's Law, which basically means I think it's every, I think it's about every, every two years, processing speeds double. I don't know if that's still true. That that one ran for 2011. So what this really means is, is we're processing more data faster. And if we can process it faster, we're processing more data. And if we can process more data, we need to process it faster. Um, I come back to the drone stuff. We're not, this race is not done. Right now, we're still struggling with it. So we collect those plant stand data we showed you. We were collecting, what was Skyler, 8 gigabytes on an 80-acre field. 8 gigabytes of data on one 80-acre field. It was taking how long to process it? Several hours. Several hours. On, a, on the fastest computer we can afford to buy. So we need processing. There is some challenges there, but we would have not even thought about doing this two years ago. Not even thought about it because guess what? We're processing faster and faster all the time. So from an in-cap standpoint, uh, I wanted to hit on a couple of key points. Um, record keeping. Probably 75% of the monitors, particularly monitors and sprayers, Maybe even higher than that. You're not using your sprayer monitors for record keeping. You're using another system. A lot of times it's pencil and paper or it's nothing at all. We, we've got to train ourselves to leverage this. First of all, they're very good. They're really good now compared to what they used to be. And if, you, if you're logging those records, we can start to do analytics against them. So you're shortchanging yourself by not doing that. Cloud connectivity is a game changer. We've talked about that. Better decisions on the fly. Uh, a team approach. And, and there seems to be this thought that, that everybody's trying to capture, maybe even go so far as to say steal your data. And, and I'm not here to get into the debate over who owns the data and all those things. As far as we're concerned, you own the data. But where the real value is, is sharing that data. It's, it's about getting, hopefully, it's us, your IS agronomist involved in what's going on on your farm. It's about having the ag leader or precision planning or whoever, the tech support, have the ability to log into your system and make sure your system is operating efficiently and, and troubleshoot things before they happen instead of after. It's about decision making. You've got the planner operator that's able to communicate with the father who's able to communicate with the son. So everybody together on the fly is making decisions and finding and solving problems before they become big problems. And maybe it involves the seed rep who's very critical in that seed placement uh, decision making process. And you want him to be a part of your team. So all I ask is that you think of this not from the standpoint solely about somebody owning your data, but who do you want to be a part of your team? Because as a team, you're going to make better decisions. Um, so we've been working on a little project um, with Papstan and Maglier and Raven. And what this is about is, is a couple things. One is sprayer contamination. Uh, we've got technology today, Dicamba. Anybody heard of Dicamba? Uh, and Dicamba has a really, really good way of staining your sprayer. And we have lots of restrictions on Dicamba where we can and can't spray. And once again, uh, JD is going to talk about this a little bit later about some of the significant major weed resistance issues we've got and we've got to face. And I think we got to be careful about just absolutely saying, I'm not using that technology. I'm just not using it. Because you may have to use that technology. So our thought process was, is it's not strictly about dicamba, but in general, we see a lot of problems with sprayer contamination. Every year we see, and sprayers are getting bigger, 120 foot booms. Um, you do the math, to, to clean out a boom, a 120 foot boom, you're going to spray about four acres before you get through that, that flush out process. So if it's wrong, you've killed four acres. Uh, we've got a rule at our place, we always start in the back. So if we kill four acres, we want to kill it in the back, not in the front. 
this picture here is, is we, we redid the sprayer, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate all contamination. Is it possible to completely get away from contamination? And that pile on the ground was all the extra hoses that were taken off that sprayer. Most of them came off of the sprayer because of, of trying to build a rinse system into it that allows us to rinse it, which isn't bad, but it also what it creates is, is another place where you can have problems. So if you're not really, really diligent about cleaning the sprayer, you're just making it worse by adding more rent hoses on there to rinse it. Typically 50 to 75 gallons, depends on your sprayer, boom hose size, whether it's one inch, three quarter, or half. But it's real easy to get 50 to 75 gallons of product in your boom and the main lines going to the boom. And if that's contaminated, that's, that's a bad thing. Mix and fill systems, almost every sprayer has a mix and fill system. Perfect place to, to have contamination. So what we did is, is we've been we, we're working with a direct injection system. And what the direct injection system does, so now we can take the chemical out of the main sprayer and we inject it into the boom right before it goes out to the crop. So what that does is it keeps the sprayer completely uh, product free. So, woo, good. The problem is, is you're going to have 1,200 to 1,500 feet. So if you decide that you want to turn the chemical on, it's 1,200 to 1,500 feet before it completely gets through the boom. And once again, that'll depend on boom size, speed, rate per acre, but in general, that's about what it takes. There's a couple other things. Uh, you're, you're really, when you do a direct injection system, you're really managing two or three sprayers at once. Each tank really becomes its own little sprayer. It'll become a little bit overwhelming, especially if you've got monitors that aren't tied together. We'll touch on that. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. If, if the green strip there, if you can see that green strip, let's say that we've got extend beans in this field and We've got a sensitive area on the, on the far side here, the green strip. If we're using a direct injection system by itself, when you see that black line, that is where we have to shut the injection off. So by the time we get to the green strip, assume we're spraying around the outside of the field, by the time we get to the green strip, we'll finally have all that chemical out of our boot. That's a long ways to go. So what we did is, is we've been toying around with a cap stand system, off the shelf system. And what we're trying to do is, is or what we did is, is, instead of injecting the chemical back into the main boom and having to go all the way through the boom system and finally get out to the nozzles, we're injecting it right at each section. So we're taking that direct injected chemical, taking it right out onto the boom within about 15 feet of where it gets to the nozzle. Once again, it depends on boom size and so So we played around with this all spring. What it does is now it gets us down to 200 to 350 feet. So now when you're in the sprayer, you're going to approaching the end around you, and this is a sensitive area. You could, within two or 300 feet, flip off your dicamba, flip on your PPO product, Flexstar or something like that, it would transition through that 300 feet, spray your end rows, flip it back, and away you go. So it's not a perfect system, but it's a very practical system. And what simply happens is the capstan system allows us to pulse modulate that direct injection chemical so it's evenly flowing throughout the boom. Without that, you can't do it. The other it does is we need a lot of rate range. And it's just like any of you that are running an AIM system, You've got, you got like an 8 to 1, 9 to 1 rate range before you have to change nozzles. It's the same way with this. So this, this become, makes it very practical to solve the first problem, and that is, is making direct injection more reactive. The other piece that, that it does is, is, um, back up here a second, is the contamination piece. What we're doing is, and you, if you would, if you got the time, come out to the field, it's easier to show it to you than to wordsmith it to you, is the, the direct injection system is such that we can completely clean the system out in about five minutes. 
and we don't have to worry. And anybody that's cleaned a sprayer out knows that's that's a major coup to be able to do that. And and we can contain it in containers. We don't have to back in the fence rows and spray you know, four acres of chemical in one spot blowing a boom out. So I would encourage you to come out and look at the sprayer and see how we do it. But it really, really helps us a lot with the contamination piece, and it really helps us a lot with the ability to, to make this more down. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, one of my little terms that I like to, to try and get people to think about is, is the velocity of data. And, and so what is he talking about? And anybody that's ever been in a macroeconomics class, they talk about the velocity of money. And the faster money turns over and over again, the more robust an economy is. And it's the same way with data. And my example to you as farmers is, is think about double crop beans. With double crop beans, you're doubling the velocity of your money. You're doubling the velocity of your data. You're raising wheat, and in the same year, you're raising soybeans. And what you guys all know is, is if you can double crop soybeans, you don't have to make all your money on wheat or all your money on soybeans. You can do both and make less money per crop, but you make more money overall if everything works right. That's the same way it works with the velocity of data. If you're only using data once, it can get kind of expensive. And I really believe that's where we've been. We've been in a place where we've done soil sampling. We've only used it for one thing and that's basically fertility recommendations. So what if we can speed up that velocity of data? What if we can use it over and over and over again? And this is just one piece of it. We can use that data much more times than this. So we use that soil test for fertility, like we talked about. We also use it for variable rate nitrogen. We also variable rate seeding. We can do logistics and, and how we can yield estimations. We can do better job of pesticide, maybe even do some variable rate pesticide, and we can do data analytics. So what does that do? That means that that, that soil test, on any one of those, all you got to do is get about a dollar out of it, and you paid for it. And that becomes really, really manageable. Huh? And I'm not using this example specifically for soil sampling. It's what we do with all the data we're collecting. If we can use it over and over again, and we should challenge ourselves to do that, it helps us become much more profitable in our operation. Future drivers. So higher resolution, lower cost of data collection. As we collect more and more, we get more and more of these, these, these cloud-based systems, the costs come down. We're going to do more and more quantitative data. We're going to be collecting real numbers. And from that, we can make better decisions. Autonomy, we haven't touched on this, but this all ties together. And we, we're all kind of trying to figure out where does autonomy fit in, in our farming operation that's way down the road. I don't think so. I think you're going to find that, that, that what's going to happen is, is you're going to, what's going to happen is it's going to find the most return on investment first. It's going to be the jobs that nobody likes to do. Maybe drag line applications or things like that. For example. But it's coming, and that is going to be a game changer. And that's probably, if I could ask you to think about anything, think about how that's going to change farming in general. Are farm sizes going to go down because of autonomy, or are they going to go up? How do you compete in the market where farm sizes go up and you're not in that, that large size? It, it's, it's something we all need to think about. So this is what I think about precision ag sometimes. That's a little white ball of golf ball up against the lip in the same track. How do I get here? How do I get out of this mess? Sometimes it can be pretty tough. That's how I feel about precision ag sometimes. Sometimes you just got to chip backwards and then go forwards, and that's precision ag. That question. Quite crap.